Hi, everyone. Welcome to Radical Exchange live stream. Thank you for being here. I'm Jennifer Marone, and I'm joined today by Matt Pruitt and Alex Rondaccio. And we'll be showing you a deliberative democracy tool that we've been developing and for we'll the be showing community. You a deliberative and I want you to know that this is an experiment. It's something that hasn't been done before, so it's going to need to keep improving. Um, but that's part of our ethos is to work on things in that way, things that haven't been done before and experiment to make them better, especially for more deliberative um, democracy processes. So if you're interested in participating in a beta launch that we're going to do starting in early May, you can write to voice at radicalexchange.org. That's voice at radicalexchange.org. And today we're going to do it where Matt is first going to talk a bit about the thinking behind Radical Exchange Voice or RxC Voice. And then Alex is going to do a demo. And then we're going to open it up to questions. And there is a Slido link on the bottom left hand side of the screen. So if you can access that to post your questions there. And now I will hand it over to Matt. Great, thanks. Um... So I want to say a little bit about this sort of uh, inspiration behind Radical Exchange Voice. Um, it's you know a project that we've been working hard on internally at Radical Exchange Foundation for a number of months now, and the uh, the idea behind it is basically uh, twofold. So we wanted to do two things. First, we we wanted to make Radical Exchange Foundation more democratically accountable to the global radical exchange community. And we're looking for uh, an interesting uh, way of doing that. And uh, second, we just have a bunch of ideas. We've, we've, we've long had a bunch of ideas about how to sort of uh, push the outer limits of what radical exchange style uh, democratic tools can do and how they can sort of be uh, stitched together into like more comprehensive end-to-end -end kind of uh, democratic processes. Um, and you know, as we as we start to think about you know combining all of all of the different things that we we work with, um, there's lots of opportunities and lots of questions. And the 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 logic is basically that there's no better uh, guinea pig than than us. So we want to, um, we want to uh, try something ambitious, try connecting a bunch of different, um, a bunch of different ideas and, um, uh, and hopefully, um, hopefully learn something. So I'm gonna share a quick presentation that um, sketches out uh, radical exchange voice uh, before, um, a little bit of discussion, and then I'll hand it over to Alex for a more of a, a concrete demo of the uh, of of what the uh, what it looks like. So, all right. Um, so, as I was saying, the the idea is is really. Um, uh, to build more of like an end-to-end -end kind of uh, democratic process using um, using a range of different radical exchange tools. So the starting place for that is um, is QV. So QV um, uh, for for anyone who's not familiar, quadratic voting is a um, an innovative voting system that allows people to uh, express different strengths of preference between different ranges of options. Um, it helps reduce polarization. Um, and basically what it is, is a, um, a way for groups to make nuanced sort of compromised decisions uh, resulting in ordered lists of priorities uh, that kind of, that give you sort of a, a, um, a good readout of which options are supported by, which options are supported most um, within a group. Um, this is something that we've used in, in, in a bunch of different contexts. And it's a, it's a terrific tool for groups to make decisions and, and set priorities. The idea in the context of Radical Exchange Foundation is um, uh, in our, in our 
pilot here in our beta, our sort of first test of Radical Exchange Voice, what we want to do is um, go out to the Radical Exchange community and, um, and, and generate a list of priorities that Radical Exchange Foundation uh, can focus on uh, for the next year, uh, um, allowing the community to hold us accountable and giving, uh, giving us something to hold ourselves uh, accountable to. So we so we begin with with QV, which, as I said, is like a great way of of coming up with a prioritized uh, list of options. But in every quadratic voting process, if you sort of zoom the camera out, there are things going on outside of the frame that aren't captured by quadratic voting. And so these are the kinds of things that we want to um, that we want to try to start to address and start to capture by stitching different tools together. In the, in the context of quadratic voting, the, uh, the big uh, thing going on outside of the frame is the construction of the ballot. So it, in every quadratic voting process, you've got a group of people making a decision between different options, but that, that, uh, that set of options is decided by a ballot, which has to be created by somebody. And you know, one of the one of the worries that often comes up when we when we deal with quadratic voting processes is that you know whoever is empowered to construct the ballot can have a lot of influence over the um, over the process. So we're thinking about you know how do we how do we give the voters themselves who aren't directly constructing the ballot um, the ability to express them you know, the ability to express whether they support the ballot, to sort of include that ballot construction process in the democratic um, vote itself. So the idea that we have come up with is essentially to take this ballot construction process and just incorporate it into the quadratic vote itself. So in other words, within, within the quadratic vote, uh, one of the list of options that can be, you know, approved or, or disapproved um, in, in the quadratic voting process is an option to, to approve or disapprove, or ratify or not ratify the actual ballot itself. So here's what that would look like concretely. You can imagine a, a quadratic voting process in which uh, there are a range of different options you might choose from. There could be candidates or they could be like goals for Radical Exchange Foundation in this context. But we just sort of append to the top of the list the question of whether the voters approve of the way that the ballot was constructed. So this gives the voters the option to um, essentially reject the ballot and say, no, we think that you know the way that this the way these options have been set up is itself biased. So go back and try again before we make the decision. This does a few. Uh, really interesting things that I want to, to call attention to. One is that if you decide to, um, if you decide to vote, if you decide to allocate voice credits for or against the ratification of the ballot, you are actually reducing the amount of say that you'll have in deciding between the options. So if you decide that you don't, that you disapprove of the way the ballot is constructed, if you want to, you can put all of your voice credits in that in that basket and sit, vote against the approval of the ballot. But if the ballot ends up getting uh, you know majority support anyway, or if you know if it gets more more um, effective votes for it than against it in the end, then you've sort of sacrificed your ability to influence which of the which of the substantive options on the ballot are um, are chosen. Uh, in a way, this actually gets at one of the uh, one of the thorniest problems in lots of different democratic processes, which is like expressive protest voting. Um, what it does that I think is interesting is it sort of segments protest votes from the rest of the decision process. So if you um, you know when when you're faced with a um, the decision of you know when you're looking at a at a quadratic voting ballot like this, 
you can essentially decide whether you want to focus on participating in the choice between the options on the ballot or whether you would like to sort of throw a wrench in the, in the process and try to send the ballot back for reconstruction. Um, the interesting thing about this is that that way, protest votes are less likely to sort of pollute the substantive decision between the options. Um, so I think that's, that's quite interesting if you think about it, because in, in a lot of different democratic processes, one of the biggest problems is um, that people are sort of choosing between the options in bad faith, um, because what they really want to say is that they don't like any of the options. Here, you can just say that you don't like any of the options. You don't like the way the ballot is constructed and focus on that. And that's sort of, um, you know, without kind of corrupting the, the conversation, without corrupting the result of, you know, uh, which, of the, which of the options is chosen. Okay. So this is, um, uh, this is one idea that we're incorporating into uh, uh, radical exchange voice. But again, if we sort of zoom out from the ballot construction process, there are other processes prior to the ballot construction that, um, that influence um, the way that the overall democratic process looks. And specifically, what that is, is deliberation. So the um, outside of the frame of, of any sort of ballot construction process, there's a larger conversation uh, or you know, either an institutional process or an informal process deciding what the options are. Um, one of our favorite um, sort of tools for democratic deliberation um, in digital contexts at scale is uh, Polis. This is something that we've talked about um, before in other contexts, but Polis is a, um, a terrific tool that has been used in, in Taiwan and, and, and other contexts to basically host large scale um, conversations, uh, soliciting ideas for proposals on, you know, whether it's legislation or, or uh, resolutions for you know, an action that an organization should take or whatever. Polis allows large numbers of people to contribute ideas, um, upvote and downvote uh, other people's ideas, um, and gives a very interesting readout uh, regarding which proposals are the most sort of consensus generating and which are the most uh, divisive. And the, you know, the whole ecosystem of, uh, of Polis is really designed with the idea of Avoiding, um, avoiding acrimonious, unproductive uh, um, exchanges, you know, the, in, of the form that you that you see in other kinds of you know social media platforms. Um, Polis is um, is is really designed to um, to gather productive, consensus generating ideas, and. So, um, so what you know what we're doing in radical exchange voice is essentially incorporating a, a polis process so that all of the voters will be participating in this large scale deliberative process. The 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 ideas and the proposals that sort of float to the top of the of the polis process as the most sort of consensus generating um, uh, ideas will be. Um, uh, essentially curated and put onto a, a, a proposed ballot by the by the admins of the process. Um, this is necessary to avoid like duplicative proposals or or bad faith proposals making it making their way um, onto the list. But um, as I was saying before, that that sort of centralized administrative function of curating the conversation into a ballot is then subjected to democratic approval at the end through that through that ratification piece. So, um, uh, so okay, so what we've now described is a, a process that go, passes from um, large scale online deliberation to the construction of ballot, to the uh, ratification of a ballot and, and, and choice between the options on the ballot. 
outside of that, outside of this deliberation process, there's another um, important uh, piece going on in any kind of, of democratic process, which is um, the determination of who gets to participate, right? So this is essentially the, the definition of the boundaries of the demos. Who's a citizen, who's not, who gets a vote, who doesn't. So we have ideas about how to, um, how to facilitate that as well. And our, our thought here is to begin each radical exchange voice uh, process with a uh, voice distribution. So uh, that, this is what Jen was referring to earlier. If you'd like to participate in our, um, in our May uh, beta, email us at uh, voice at radicalexchange.org and uh, we will invite you to participate. Essentially what we'll do is start off by distributing um, a set of voice credits um, to uh, you know, casting a broad net, essentially trying to, trying to bring in um, as many people as possible who are, um, you know, who've had some, some contact or some involvement with the radical exchange movement. Um, and begin with that. Uh, now, as part of this voice distribution process, if you distributed some credits, you will then uh, have the ability to uh, take some of the credits that, that you have been given and distribute them on to other people, thus like increasing the set of people who uh, are participating in the process and also um, moving uh, credits around um, to reflect like, you know, who people think should, uh, should have uh, more say. If people think that, you know, that it makes sense for some people to have more credits than others, we're, we're opening that decision as well to this sort of democratic process. The distribution of credits is also going to be um, uh, matched with a, uh, like a quadratic funding match, which um, we can talk more about, about later. But the, the general idea here is you know I, so I've just talked through this process sort of in reverse. But now, if you imagine participating in it chronologically, this is what it would look like. The way it looks is uh, you're invited to participate in a radical exchange voice process. Some credits are distributed to you. You have the option of distributing those credits farther on to um, to other people. This results in uh, a set of voters, a set of people who get some say in the process those people um, participate in this large scale digital deliberation process using polis. The polis conversation is then um, uh, abstracted into a, into a quadratic voting ballot. That quadratic voting ballot is then either approved or disapproved as part of the vote on the ballot itself. And if it is, if it is approved, if it's ratified, then the the you know the ordered the ordering of the options on the on the rest of the ballot essentially becomes the result of the election. So in, in the case of, of our first beta, this will be a um, a list of priorities for Radical Exchange Foundation to pursue on behalf of the broader Radical Exchange movement for the next year. Um, now you can imagine this entire process uh, iterating. Right, so after we do one, uh, after we do sort of our, our, our first beta, then there could be, you know, then we could uh, pass on, you know, to like the next, the next question, the next ballot formation question, at the beginning of which voice credits could again be redistributed to other people, broadening the set of voters, passing to another um, uh, election, and and so on. And our hope with this, of course, is that. Uh, if this proves to be like a successful um, experiment where you know, democratic decisions can be can be taken intelligently and at scale, uh, we want to make it available to uh, to other sorts of organizations or movements or um, or or um, whoever maybe even governments uh, who are interested in um, in working with this kind of thing. Uh, but we are super excited. Uh, as an initial matter to uh, experiment with it with the radical exchange uh, community 
uh, hopefully learn something and refine it and um, make a contribution to the to the broader conversation about uh, about digital uh, democracy and deliberation and participation and um, and all of that fun stuff. So uh, with that, I will I'll pause uh, see if we can uh, answer any questions or have a um, a bit of a um, yeah, I think there, thank you, Matt. I think there are a few questions that are really useful to answer now before doing the demo, and then maybe a couple that we can talk about after the demo. So one of them was, um, well, basically, did we consider any other uh, platforms to deliberate besides Polis? And we were used to Polis, uh, we liked it, it was there. Um, from my side, I didn't offer any alternatives, but I think it just worked well for our purposes. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, Polis is, um, uh, Polis in a way uh, is targeting exactly the problem that we were hoping to solve uh, here. Uh, and for that reason, we kind of be actually, you know, began uh, this um, this exercise with the idea of potentially incorporating Polis uh, mm -hmm. as a as a way of of soliciting proposals that could feed into a quadratic voting ballot. Um, I think that as uh, as we experiment with this, as we get people using it and um, start to see how it works, um, the the idea of uh, substituting polis for other kinds of deliberation tools will definitely become an option. So, I mean, this is this is a very sort of modular um, uh, modular sure. tool. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I mean, one thing once we once we've run it with with polis uh, um, and seen how that works, the idea of using other things is a live option yeah and, and if I, sorry if i can if i can jump in on that i would say um one thing that we are considering for later on is adding like discord functionality <laughs> or something like that like a chat room type of functionality because uh you know as matt kind of went over polis does some very specific things that uh at least i don't know of any other platform that that does them which is this kind of backend data analysis. Uh, well, first of all, forcing users to kind of interact with each other's opinions in a way that prevents them from getting bogged down in their disagreements. And, uh, and then this kind of backend after the fact analysis that surfaces the, uh, like where the opinion groups are in the demos and also where there's agreement between the opinion groups so where the disagreements are and where the consensus is generated and that's something that most other uh that that other platforms don't do but it also you know polis doesn't have the ability for kind of longer form deliberation like if i want to make if i want to make like a longer form argument for if i want to not only suggest a proposal but give a longer form argument for why i think it's a good proposal or why a different one is a bad proposal that's something that Polis can't do right now. And so that's why I think that it will be useful to kind of add some kind of more like chat room functionality. And we have some kind of interesting ideas for how we could do that in a, in a, in a way that fosters good, you know, quality conversation. Maybe we can talk about that later. Yeah, yeah well, that, that pertains. Tom, Tom Atley had brought up, he had asked about the deliberative dynamic of our RC voice earlier, but now he just said, why not use the voice distribution to select people to be in a facilitated conversation to generate the ballot from the polis conversation? I'll put that. Did you get yeah, that? so so there's a, there's a number of um, I think that all these questions are are um, uh, highlighting essentially the the modularity and the adaptability of this. So you know when we do this when we run this first beta, we, there are a few sort of assumptions in how we're structuring it um, 
that are based on the fact that it's you know it's tailored for um, the the problem before us, which is to run kind of a digital, um, um, you know, sort of an all digital asynchronous process, incorporating lots of different people from all around the world who are connected to radical exchange. Um, if we, um, but like, uh, you know, there are obviously things that can be done in like in-person deliberation that can't be done on polis. So for so if you subbed out polis for an in-person deliber deliberation, like a facilitated in-person deliberation exercise, that would be very interesting. It would make perfect sense. Uh, similarly, the, that that process of abstracting the deliberation into a ballot could be done in any number of ways. So in 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 this first test run, we're going to have a post conversation. Uh, and the, you know, essentially, radical exchange foundation, as the admins of the process will abstract it into a ballot, which will then be uh, put up for ratification. But you could imagine all kinds of interesting ways of changing, uh, changing the way that that abstraction pro process happens. So it could be done by sortition, for example, you could like, um, radic you could um, you know randomly choose someone from the group to perform that abstraction function. Uh, you could hold another uh, vote uh, um, in between the deliberation and the and the uh, you know ballot creation process of voting for who gets to do that. Um, so all of these are are live options, and I th I think that you know you could some of them would would add more complexity, some of them would be simpler. Um, but we um, are interested in all of them, basically. And uh, the the hope is to, uh, you know, we're going to start somewhere, and then we're going to start and then we'll think about essentially what we can, what we can layer in what we can tweak what we what we can improve in this sort of modular approach. Yeah. And also, I must say that we've been using this on a smaller scale internally. And of course, we don't only go with polis and then make the final decision on that. We incorporate discussions and we deliberate among ourselves. And that's something that we need to experiment with basically and why we're asking you to join in to figure out on what, what levels does that happen? What tools are best to use for that? Um, maybe some decisions don't need that process, but for somebody that might want to come in and say, no, we need to talk about this in a different way, not just through a, through a text-based platform or something. Um, so that's, that's part of what we're trying to also do together with you. Um, so another question that is really interesting is, Matt, you went on a bit about the approved ballot. So for an example like that, this is from Jacob Kelter. Do you only need do you only need the vote on approved ballot to be less than zero to reject it? For, for example, if only one person votes on it and another votes minus one, is the ballot then rejected? Yeah, so this is another eminently tweakable uh, parameter. Um, I, I think that the way, the way we'll do this first uh, beta is essentially that if the, uh, if the, approve option gets positive effective votes, then we will, uh, we'll, we'll consider it approved. Um, but um, yeah, it's going, it's going to take more reps before we get a feel for whether or not that's actually right. So we might, we might want to set a, a minimum number of, um, uh, of approve votes uh, that we would need in order to consider a ballot to be approved, for example. Um, uh, I think it, it, it is, you know, it, it, in either case, you know, the, the, whatever the, whatever the rule is needs to be sort of clearly communicated to the voters in advance, obviously. So like if, if the, if the uh, threshold for approving a ballot is just any positive, um, uh, effective votes, 
just having a you know, net positive effect of votes, then um, that might cause some people to sort of like not bother to uh, waste any voice credits on it, assuming that it will get approved, um, uh, which would you know create a possibility that somebody who goes all in against it would uh, would be able to. You know, so th th there's an, there are complex dynamics that you know we don't we don't fully understand, and we'll get a better feel for uh, with more reps about you know sort of what the right approval threshold is. But um, uh, for 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 beta, I think uh, it makes sense to just go with the the simplest possible rule, which is that um, if it's if it's in the positive, then we'll consider it approved. Thanks, Matt. A couple of others, and then let's move on, Alex, to the demo. So I think this one's really interesting. I don't know if we should talk about it now or maybe later at the end. Uh, what proposed mechanisms exist to deal with the multiple community approved proposals that are mutually exclusive to each other? Yeah. Uh, I think that would send it back into probably another process. I mean, I, I think that that's actually one of the things that the ballot construction needs to be attentive to. Mm. So, for example, if uh, if the if if different proposals, um, I mean, there are two ways. There are more than there's more than one way for things to be sort of in tension with one another, right? So, mm. it could it could be that um, that different priorities are just sort of drawing on. Uh, the same set of resources. And so if that's the case, um, I think it's fine for them to sort of share a ballot. It's fine for, you know, um, multiple, I mean, it's in, in a way that's, that's what any kind of um, uh, different priorities are doing. They're drawing on the same resources. And so that kind of thing is fine. I do think it might, it might be um, uh, the case that, um, that some options are just uh, radically um, mutually exclusive uh, with others. And I think that the, the ballot creation process will have to um, uh, use, it will involve the use of judgment in making sure that, um, that the final ballot doesn't look like that. Um, and that will be part of what is uh, being approved or disapproved in the, in the ratification. Um, and then finally, one last one, I think, before we move on. This process of polis, is that step public? If not, how can people tell if the ballot generation was fair? So it's public to everybody that's part, part of the, that process. So it's not made public to the public, or we have, you know, that's part of what we're building and deciding that decision. But right now we're working on if there's a ballot um, generation and a process happening. Everybody that's part of that, that's in the delegation gets to see that. Yeah, and I think it, it could be made public yeah. um, to, the, to the broader public too, but at, at, at a minimum, um, a process like this would, you would need the, the, the entire polis conversation to be, um, uh, legible and public to everyone voting on the ratification of the of the ballot, yeah. um, right? So, I mean that that's the that's the basic data that they'll be looking at. In other words, is this conversation fairly represented in that ballot? Yeah. And if there are people in the public that should be seeing it that are not, they should be included as a delegate. And so that that should be and maybe something to take into consideration of like when you are delegating. Um, who really needs, who is a stakeholder in this? Because if it's part of the public that has nothing to do with the question or doesn't care, um, it wouldn't matter if it's public or not, basically. Okay. Yeah, I, think, I think part of our thinking about, about delegation followed by the polis conversation that's closed to the, the members of the delegation is getting people in the community to think really hard about who should have a voice, right? Um, kind of like quadratic voting, 
part of what's great about it is that it forces people to think really hard about what they really care about, you know, because they have a finite budget that they're allocating between proposals. And in the delegation, it's sort of the same idea, but you're allocating a budget across potential participants. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to go? Alex, are you ready for the demo? Yeah, sure. Let's move on to the demo. And thanks um, for the questions, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. And Matt gave such a comprehensive um, overview of the main ideas at, at play here. So I'll, I guess I'll keep this pretty brief, but um, I'll just show you what sort of the beta version of the app looks like right now and kind of connect some of these concepts to actual features. So go ahead and share my screen. Um, so as Matt mentioned, you know, we start out with basically an initial set of delegates. And then this delegation stage begins where those, those participants have, uh, an, each of them start out with an equal number of voice credits and they have the option to basically invite more people. So if I'm a user and I'm invited either by the Radical Exchange Foundation um, or from someone from that initial pool, um, and I'll log in and this is where I'll start out. I'll, I'll end up in this delegation stage and this is what it looks like right now. So this is where we're gonna address that problem of who gets to participate in the decision. So I can see here a list of everyone who's currently included. Uh, I'm here, I just logged in. Leon's here, Jen's here. Um, and as for as long as the delegation stage is running, I have the option with my voice credits, it looks like I have 100 right now. I have the option to expand the delegation by inviting someone. So if I see that Matt's not here, I can click here and I can type in his email and I can send him some of my voice credits that way. Um, and then he'll receive an email and he'll be able to join as well. He'll start out with the number of voice credits that I gave him. Um, I also have the option to give voice credits to someone who's already in the list, as you can see here. So I can give some voice credits to Leon if I think that Leon is trustworthy or I think he has um, some expertise or knowledge about the issue at hand, or if I value the contributions he's made to the community and I think he deserves to have more of a say. These are all, you know, there's all kinds of reasons why you might wanna do that. But for as long as the delegation stage is running, I have the option to move my voice credits around in that way and expand the pool of participants. I also have the option, of course, to keep all of my voice credits to myself. And that's just as well because I'll need them later on in the election stage. So once we've finished the delegation stage, we have determined who is participating in the process. And we move on to the deliberation stage, which is where we're going to, as a community, draft the ballot of proposals. Um, and it's we're going to use that polis conversation that we were talking about. So. I'm going to kind of manually admin us into the deliberation stage. So if I log in during the deliberation stage, this is what I'll see. Um, so what I'm looking at is a polis conversation. Um, so when I get here, I can see the proposals that other people in the delegation have already made before I got here and they're in this stack right here. So I can go through and I can react to them by hitting agree, disagree, or pass. And I can sort of express my, my opinions in that way for the, for the suggestions that other people have made. So if we're here drafting, like we've been talking about the, uh, an agenda of priorities for the Radical Exchange Foundation in 2021, these are some suggestions that people have made. So we have like more real life quadratic funding experiments to fund public goods and local economies. I can agree with that. 
maybe I'll disagree with something someone else said. Maybe I'm not so sure about something. I can react to all of them. I also have the option to make a suggestion myself. If I, you know, I have some other proposal that I want to make, this is where I'll submit it. And so what happens is we generate this pool of proposals from the community and we're getting this really detailed information about what where the consensus is where the disagreement is and we the administrators and also the community can see all that information in the polis report which is actually at the bottom here so this is sort of a mock-up conversation so there's not a lot of great data in here because it's fake but this is where we would see some some really great detailed information about what's been happening so we have polis sorts the participants into opinion groups here based on you know the people in group a agreed on, tended to agree on this statement but they tended to disagree with group b on this statement so we can see all that here we can also see sort of a ranking by consensus of all of the proposals that have been submitted so basically this spot right here is where we, the administrators, the Radical Exchange Foundation, will curate the ballot from this basically crowdsource list of proposals. So we might take, you know, the top 10, some top percentage, or all of them, but we'll do that transparently. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll say that ahead of time that we're going to take the top 10 or whatever it is. And the idea is that we give in this ballot ratification process by laying this all out transparently, we give the community the opportunity to go back to the polis report and look at it themselves right here. And I can check that it was done honestly and that the proposals from the community were represented accurately and in good faith by the administrators of the process. So that's the deliberation stage. And at the end, we'll have curated this ballot and we'll move on to the election stage. So I'll go ahead and do that right now. I just have to click through a couple things here since I'm adminning in real time. And this is where, you know, we'll, we'll be curating the ballot, but right now for the, for the purpose of the demo, I've just kind of popped six proposals in to the election for us to see. Um, so this is what the election page looks like. So now if I'm a user and I log in during the election stage, this is what I'll see. Um, so I'm looking at the proposals here and these were all submitted by people in the community. These are the top consensus getting polis suggestions that have been pulled, we've removed the any like duplicate entries or anything like that as the administrators. And I have this budget of voice credits left over from whatever I did or didn't do in the delegation stage. And I can allocate that budget across these proposals. And we have this kind of nice um, little graphic here that shows sort of the cost of voice credits for each vote going up as I add votes. And then at the bottom here, we have the ballot ratification proposal that we were talking about before. So if I am looking at the, this is where, I, as I'm looking at the ballot, if I think, gee, this, like, this isn't an accurate representation of what happened in the polis conversation at all, um, or I think that the administrators were you know, intentionally misrepresented it in some way or, or whatever, then I can choose to vote down the ballot ratification proposal and potentially overturn the results of the election. But just to illustrate what we were touching on earlier, if I decide to allocate a ton of voice credits to voting down the ballot, then we have this interesting dynamic where let's say I use almost all my voice credits on that. If I do that, then we see that you know I've it's taken from the same budget of voice credits that I use to allocate across to express my preferences preferences for the uh, for the proposals. 
So what I have left over is, you know, a pretty weak influence over the results of the election in the case that it's passed. So, uh, you know, I can spend a couple here to express my preferences, but if I'm the only person that disapproved of the ballot and the ballot passes, then I wasn't able to really express my preferences or influence the outcome of the decision because I wasted them all here. So what that does is that forces me to think really hard about, you know, forces me to think really hard about whether there is something among these proposals that I would accept as an outcome of the process. So instead of just, you know, throwing a wrench in the whole process, it, it, it you know, it makes me think about it a little bit more and express a, a little bit more nuanced um, information about my preferences. So that's basically the whole process. And if I submit my votes, then I can see the results show up of the election. Um, so that's, that's basically the beta version of the app as it currently looks. There's, it's, I'm still working very hard on it. So there's parts of it that will probably look quite different by the time we do our uh, beta launch in May, um, but that's that's what it looks like right now. So should we move on to questions or? Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, so one of the first questions, if we go all the way back to the beginning, the delegation, well, I guess even just signing in, uh, one of the questions from Get Jerry Hussein is, is there a public profile requirement to participation? Or put it another way, what if there, what, if any, are the digital ID requirements for participating? Right. So the identity problem is one of the biggest problems that we are continuing to think about because as, you know, as we all know, it's like one of the great unsolved problems of like decentralized community governance. Um, so what we have right now is a uh, sort of like a band-aid solution that we'll iterate upon in the future because ultimately as we've said this is this is an experiment and the focus of the experiment is in how to connect these sort of three different processes the how to connect these tools quadratic voting with delegation with polis so it's not a perfect solution what we have right now to the identity problem but you know, we're hoping to iterate on it in the future. So what it, what it is right now is we, you will be required to connect your account to, or to verify your account using a social media account, like a Twitter account or a GitHub account, just so, just so that the people, other people in the community can, you know, verify that you are who you say you are. And that's our current approach. Matt, do you want to add to that at all? Yeah, and, and it's, uh, it's not, uh, there's no uh, pretense that this is even close to ideal. It's just a, uh, it's just a sort of a, a, a kludge for our first, uh, for our first round here to make sure that we can do some kind of a beta without rampant, uh, you know, civil attacks and, and right. sock puppets. Um, in the, in the future, we, um, we, we, we believe that, I mean, actually in the quite near future, we, we will uh, replace this with like a, um, um, uh, whatever the, you know, something like a, a, a bright ID or an IDENA or, um, or some other kind of uh, new, interesting proof of personhood, identity shielding type, um, uh, type tool that can allow us to um, to solve the problem in a in a more interesting way. But right now, this is a we we have a we have a band aid on on an open issue as far as identity goes. Mm -hmm. Okay, we only have how much time do we have? We have quite a bit of time, right? Forty minutes. Yeah. Right. Okay, so I'm going to try and I wonder if it's better, Alex, if you keep up the the page so we can first go through all like the the voice credit delegation section questions and then move on to sure. each one. So the next one regarding 
bringing people in and passing around uh, voice credits. One is from Simone, how do we prevent corruption, coercion in the distribution of voice credits, we, which we talked about yesterday? Yeah, this is something that we've thought about a lot and mm -hmm. is also something that we don't have a final solution for. Um, we have a solution for this you know, we, we, we similarly have kind of a bandaid over this for the, for the beta launch, um, which is that we'd like to at, at the very least prevent, we, we've talked about a lot of different ways that you can do this. Like one, one thing that's come up is, well, should, should I, maybe I should talk about matching. Should, is, is, would this be a good time to talk about matching? Sure. Um, so another element that I sort of skipped over for the for the sake of simplicity in the demo is we added an interesting element to the delegation stage here with quadratic funding, where if I decide to give credits to Leon here, then you can see and you can see it illustrated here in the estimated match. There's a there's a matching fund for every delegation stage. So for this one, it's 500 voice credits is where I set it at. So if I decide to give 10 of my voice credits to Leon, well, I guess I, since I already went through the process, the matching has already paid out behind the scenes. So you can't see it right now, but um, using quadratic funding, we match all of the transfers in the delegation stage. So if I give some of my voice credits to Matt and Jen also gives some of her voice credits to Matt, then using quadratic funding, we calculate a match from the matching fund and Matt also receives that. So that's an, that's an added element to the delegation stage that kind of adds to the democraticness of it because the, due to the way quadratic funding works, the more different people send voice credits to the same person, there's sort of a bonus that gets added to the match they receive. Whereas if only I send, only one person sends voice credits to one person, then that transfer won't be matched because it's only one contribution. Um, so that's, that's one thing that, that does kind of help the collusion, or well, that does kind of help like, for certain kinds of civil attacks, I suppose, because you need to have um, there's, there's more influence given to accounts that receive some kind of like, some kind of, uh, you know, display of trust in the form of a, of a, of a transfer from multiple accounts. However, it does kind of open the door to different kinds of collusion to, um, sort of cheat the quadratic funding calculation. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, if, if I do figure out a way to, kind of create Sybil accounts for myself, then I have the ability to send one voice credit to 10 different Sybil accounts. And then from each of those Sybil accounts, send that voice credit back to myself and then rake in a quadratic funding match. So it, it complicates the collusion problem in, in, in certain ways like that. So We've been, that's something that we've been thinking about a lot. And, you know, obviously a better identity solution will do a lot to fix, especially the example that I just said, because if you protect against civil attacks, then you protect against that type of collusion. Um, another way is you can prevent people from sending voice credits back to someone who already, who, who sent voice credits to them. So you can, you know, kind of prevent two people just kind of um, building up a match between the two of them. Um, but it's an open question. It's something we're having a lot of conversations about. It's a, it's a, and some really interesting I ideas. Matt, do you? Yeah, I mean, to... what I would, what I would add is that we're going to, um, we're going to learn everything we can from Gitcoin grants here. Right. So, you know, like when, when Gitcoin grants got you know got started obviously there was uh there was worry that uh, uh collusion etc would undermine the entire process and um 
Uh, and in a way, there's reason to think that you should be more worried about that in the context of Gitcoin grants than in something like this, because Gitcoin grants presents an opportunity to actually extract uh, real money for uh, for your project through a through a quadratic funding process. Um, and uh, looking at the first um, eight rounds of Gitcoin grants, there has definitely been uh, misbehavior, but I think it hasn't been as uh, as bad as uh, uh, many people would have predicted. And Gitcoin has gotten a lot better at studying the studying the what's going on essentially in the um, in the uh, the contributions in the process, studying sort of the patterns of contribution and trying to figure out um, you know, who's, who's abusing it and how much is abuse is occurring. Um, we will do something similar. And again, it'll, this will be an iterative process where we'll, we'll learn more through different reps, but we're going to study the, the patterns of uh, voice credit distribution and the patterns of voting um, in the first few experiments that we do and try to understand um, uh, how, much, uh, how much collusion is happening um, and um, perhaps, uh, you know, we might ban users that are clearly abusing it um, or, uh, or, you know, reverse processes that seem to have been uh, uh, too badly uh, corrupted um, or, uh, you know, uh, essentially figuring out as it, it as we go along. So I think that these problems are um, uh, are impossible to completely uh, completely expunge and completely remove. But uh, as in any uh, as in any kind of election, um, uh, the challenge is to minimize them to structure the sort of uh, incentives and, and so on in, in the right ways so that it's at least um, at least hard to collude and ideally you know so hard that it's just not worth anyone's time to go to jump through the hoops that they would need to to really effectively um, uh, corrupt the process um, and uh, and we'll see yeah I mean hopefully we can uh, keep the level of malfeasance low enough that the process remains, uh, you know, retains its basic integrity. So, one, sorry, one other, one other approach that I'd quickly mention is that um, Leon actually had an idea recently that we're thinking about implementing, which is not uh, init not initiating transfers until the end of the delegation stage. So, giving people the option to, you know, go on the list and allocate credits to people who they want to send them to but it only saves you know it only saves that information it doesn't actually send the voice credits until the delegation stage has ended that way you know people don't see what they've received from people or uh, you know until until it's too late for them to collude basically so you 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 can't really enforce hey i'll send you voice credits once i see that i've received them from you if that doesn't happen until transfers are closed. And then there are even things that we haven't even begun to get into such as like, what if 10, well, we've gotten into it, but we haven't um, made choices and decisions on what to do about it. Say if like 10 people send one person at the same time, basically each 10 credits, what happens in that? Like, does only one person really invite them and they only get 10 credits or do they get essentially all 100 credits, things like that we, we haven't discussed. But one person, speaking of Leon, who has the most credits in this example, in this demo, um, what happens, this is from Jen, are you guys going to do quadratic voting redistribution for voice credits after each vote? Yeah, uh, TV, sorry, go ahead. TBD. yeah, go ahead, Alex. Yeah. No, you, you go ahead. We haven't decided yet. Yeah, we, we have we haven't decided. You know, we'll 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 do uh we'll we'll roll out the beta before we uh before we start the beta, we will we'll make clear um uh, our intention with mm -hmm. things like that. But 
there's going to be some learning here. This is going to be like a, yeah, um, um, an experiment that the community is participating in. So, yeah. um, uh, I don't know, we'll figure it out. And, uh, once we've, once we've got this down, once we've got this process, um, uh, as buttoned up as, um, as, as we can, and we start, you know, making this available to, to other organizations and stuff. I think that that kind of thing will be, uh, that will again be like a, um, a, a dial that can be tweaked by whatever mm -hmm. institution is, is using this tool. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, th I think we'll probably in our use case, we'll, we'll probably reset everybody's voice credits at the end of each process, at least to start. Um, because I think we probably want to see how this all works, all, how these tools all work together before we introduce the element of, you know, strategic voice credit saving. Because that's, you know, really a whole different um, area of experimentation. Mm. Yeah, there's some thoughts that come up, but those would be good to talk about once we start the beta launch and experimenting with more people, I think. Um, so one is actually, I'm not sure if there is an answer to this from my side. I don't know. Is it, this is from Sean, is it possible to give voice credits to someone to only spend on a specific vote? So basically if I think somebody has really a lot of expertise on one specific, um, decision that needs to be made, can I just invite them for that? but or they like once they're in there they're in for all questions is the question about uh so if we have our our you know topic like radical exchange agenda 2021 um if you are inviting someone to just that or if you invite them will they also participate in radical exchange agenda 2022 is that is that the question yeah so i guess the delegation, I think this is the question. It says, for example, if I think someone has good ex expertise for one decision in the ballot, but I don't want them to spend my credits on other decisions without telling me. So um, that's how I, I understand mean, the question. Yeah. So what you said, Alex, is correct. Okay. Yeah, I, I think our idea is if you invite someone, it's for the, it's you invite someone to a decision. To the decision at hand um but i think it's i mean i th i think that i we intend this to be an experiment not just for our own use of course but we we, we intend this to be an experiment that will become an example for how these tools can be used for all kinds of different communities to govern themselves and I think there's a, a lot of use cases where, you know, it would make sense for a delegation to be kind of expanding and contracting and, and fluid across many different decisions that it's making and for people to have, you know, voice credits carry through and, and, and stuff like that. But I, I think for, for our use case, we'll, it'll probably reset, like I said, about the voice credits. I think it's actually a really interesting idea, though, that we yeah. we haven't we didn't talk about that specifically. Like, if we if you could invite people, I mean, if you could essentially distribute uh, credits to people that were limited to, you know, if you, so, in other words, if you if you were participating in a process that would have multiple iterations where credits could be saved between different decisions, it would be interesting uh, to create an option to restrict a credit distribution to a particular decision. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just interesting idea. I, I don't think yeah. we thought yeah, about it. Yeah, I think it. it's really, really something to consider. Um, again, from Sean, do losing votes get their voice tokens refunded or are all votes com committed? If unsuccessful votes are not refunded, will people be overly cautious about options they feel strongly positive about, but don't think they will succeed? Um, no, 
they don't get their votes refunded. What it, I think once you commit your votes, then they're gone, right? Once you use your credits, you don't get them back if they haven't been, if it hasn't worked right. out in your favor, unless I'm misunderstanding the question. Yeah, so if, I mean, if you vote on an option that does not win, then those credits are still gone. Um, mm -hmm. The but if you if you're talking about the um, ratification, then that's different, right? So yeah. if if the um, if a ballot does not pass, then everything will be reset. Yeah, uh, right. For the right. next ballot. Right. Yeah. If, if, if the, if the ballot ratification is sort of overturned, then that overturns the results of the election and everybody gets their voice credits back. Right. Yeah. I didn't understand the question at first, but yeah, that's yeah. a good question. Mm -hmm. um, another one from Jen, as you're building the future of democracy, hopefully, what are you doing to track or correct slash present, prevent um, gender bias inherent in the tech econ space that makes up our community. Yeah, that's, um, that needs some, I think, really proactive delegates in the beginning with that clear intention. Um, I think, and it sort of reminds me of a, like some interesting things that Matt and I have been talking about, about how, about like how you, how you manage delegation, you know, if we're expanding on the way that we, that we establish a delegation, that we establish who's included in a community and who's not. Yeah. Um, we've been thinking about a lot of ways that, you know, or we've been thinking a lot about ways that you can make it inclusive, but still secure against bad faith participants. And, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing, you know, especially if you have kind of like a social network based identity system, which ours kind of is right now, because you're, you know, in, in our system, trust is kind of like a binary. You're either in or you're out. And you're in if you receive voice credits from someone and you're out if you don't. And you only receive voice credits from someone if they, if they know you personally. So, you know, that in, does kind of introduce like identity problems there, which is something that we've thought about because, you know, one question that uh, someone we were speaking with recently raised was how can you make it how, how can you open it up to people who are you know thinking about if, if you could eventually get this like on chain the idea of in in blockchain is for everything to be completely trustless and um, completely inclusive so as long as you know what you what you want in these systems of, in the long run is to um, be inclusive of anyone who can prove that they're a human being and you shouldn't have to already like have a personal connection with someone in the radical exchange community who will give you voice credits you know so that i that's i i think that that question for for me is like very much tied to the identity proof of personhood problem that we were talking about earlier mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not it's not something we've sorted out, Jen. So please participate if you have ideas, or if you don't, um, just figuring it. It's something to figure out together. I know we threw around some ideas that, you know, in the end, sound really um, exclusive or extra, uh, what's it called discriminatory. So of course we can't do those in the end. Like if you try and put quotas on what kinds of people, but then you come down to what Alex just said in terms of identity being one of the big hurdles. Matt, did you want to add anything? I think you covered the territory. Yeah. It's, um, it's a, 
uh, hugely um, important problem that um, we're trying to figure out how to deal with in the right way. I think, you know, a major um, uh, part of the solution has to be informal norms. Um, I think that's true, like in any, in any community that the, uh, basically the, the norms of, uh, of good behavior uh, within the community that are, you know, uh, have to be um, constantly attended to. And I, you know, when we, uh, when we essentially, uh, for example, when we do our beta and uh, reach out to uh, a bunch of people in the radical exchange community to, um, to participate in it, we're going to make every possible effort to, uh, to include diversity along every possible axis. Um, and I think that by doing that, we will hopefully help embed uh, uh, that norm of the appreciation of, of diversity uh, within the people who are then empowered to steward the community from there. Uh, but, you know, it's not a, uh, it's not a problem that we have a uh, watertight um, and all be all solution for it's, it's an ongoing journey. Yeah. So there are a few questions around polis and some I had asked this before from Andrea Gallagher, were there any others that we considered? And we said, no, um, Sean recommended Lumio. Thanks, Sean. Um, some criticisms or considerations around polis from Andrea again, she said, it feels like it suffers when proposals are badly written unclear overlapping and I've definitely in some of the use cases that we've done I've seen that happen for example especially when one one um, proposal has two questions and you're like okay well which one am I agreeing to or not disagreeing to and you end up passing on it um, and they cannot be edited in polis which is what you just asked so I'm answering that or is that solved by adding a new proposal and ask people to rate on the new one? Basically, there are different ways you can do it. So either you could just let that be and say, if you're one of the people and you say, well, that's not very clear, but that I want to make a new statement that makes that clear. And so you can either split up the question and just make it so that you think this is more answerable um, or you could reframe it, rephrase it so that you think it's clear. And then what happens in the stage of, uh, I don't we, you called it yesterday, Alex curation, but I think there's a better word for it, which isn't coming to mind, but basically like that's something Alex would do. He would go through and say, well, these two are the same. So one of them gets removed and those votes go to, or those agreements or disagreements, every way that people voted on it, go to that one get transferred basically. Um, I think that answered that question. I hope. And then Lumio we haven't considered, but you know, we could also try, I don't, I'm speaking for Alex who's been responsible for building this. I don't want to create more work, but maybe there could be like a, a Polis version and a Lumio version so we could compare or, you know, uh, another question about polis. What about the problem definition? This isn't really a problem, a question about polis. This is just in, de in general about um, deliberative democracy or what goes on the ballot is defining the question. So polis is good for discussing solutions and making proposals, but how do you create a good problem definition? And that I mean, <laughs> so I have a, I have a, some thoughts about that. So yeah. I think that what, what this question points to is, um, is the fact that basically there's always something going on outside of the frame, like always. So, you know, the way that I was setting up this issue earlier was, you know, that in, in, in in quadratic voting, there's this thing going on outside the frame, which is the ballot construction, or something going on outside the frame of that. 
there's always something going on outside the frame, always. And so, and I, I think that this is, this is something that's important to understand actually, to, in order to have a really deep conception of what democracy is. So in other words, like when, um, you know, in, in this case, uh, in the case of this beta, right? Radical Exchange Foundation will be defining the problem saying, um, hey, uh, we would like to uh, uh, have a democratically arrived at um, uh, list of priorities for us to focus on and be held accountable to for the next year, right? Now that, um, that happened outside the frame of, of democracy though, right? I mean, we just decided that that's what we wanted to do. We decided that we wanted to um, incorporate a democratic process into um, into our organization, um, into in, into the movement. And that's what every democratic institution does, right? I mean, that's what the that's what democratic governments do, right? It, it, in in principle, if everyone in power in in uh, you know Denmark decided, no, we're, we're just going to you know stop asking the the public uh, to choose the next uh, parliament or whatever. Um, they could do that. So, you know, in, in, in a sense, there's, there is an infinite regress here, but I think that what good democracy is or what real democracy is, is it's not cutting that, that it's not stopping that infinite regress because it, it, it actually conceptually is never stopped. What it is, is, um, is building institutions whose legitimacy depends upon a good faith effort to incorporate democracy, um, and uh, that's what that's what you know uh, effective historical examples of democracy have done, and um, and that's what we're trying to do. It always leaves something outside the frame, but hopefully that that thing that's left outside the frame uh, is but has been done uh, in good faith and with the intention to build a, a genuine democratic community. And that's, that's the best you can do. Like that's, that's what, when people, uh, when, you know, in a political context, when people write a democratic constitution or something, that's what they're doing. Yeah, I always think about, basically, it's like, do you need to start with what problems should we even considered, consider? And that be even one of the first processes is what, what do we need to ask ourselves? Um, somebody still needs to ask that question. What problems do you want to ask yourself? So that's, you know, is how far do you need to go with it? Um, okay. there's, there's actually an, also another practical approach to answering that question about defining the, the problem that's come out of the polis community itself, which is have another polis conversation. The, this kind of they call it the double diamond approach i've i've heard about where it's it, you know instead if you if you want to define the problem before you have the polis conversation defining the solutions then just have another polis conversation where then the community has to kind of converse with each other and yeah. you know about their values and figure out where the consensus is on actual like values that you bring to the table before you even start with having the conversation yeah. it's just like then, if you if you're sitting here in a room and we're trying to decide on what to do with x problem and then we're like wait a minute we don't even know about this thing that has to happen before so let's step back and let's figure out that solution and then we realize oh so and so is not even in here and they really need to be part of this discussion so now we have to start over again let's go back to this question then they might even say Oh well, you haven't even thought about this, and you know, so that can. But is there, is that the wrong way to do it? I don't think so. I think that's a. Yeah. We might not get very far, but I think you, actually you, you once might... you solve these problems that are behind, then maybe you can get there faster because it's clear. You might even have an RxE voice process to determine what RxE voice processes we should have over the course of the year and what order we should have them. <laughs> Yes. or how to build it. <laughs> yeah. 
you, whether to you use them. You, <laughs> you go as far upstream as you can. Yeah. You go as far, but you know, eventually right. you find that you know you there's uh, diminishing the returns. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, are there any discussions, thoughts around an onion skin skin paradigm for the depth of participant engagement with RxC voice? So does that mean like from the polis to the discord or whatever? Is that how you would, you both would understand that question? And like diving more into depth into the conversation and to the deliberation or into more phases? I guess it's kind of the same thing. I'm not, so, sure. this is the onion skin. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna put it in the sure chat in case you can't see the slide. <clears throat> Are there any discussions or thoughts around an onion skin paradigm for the depth depth of participant engagement with RxC voice? I think the answer is no, given that we're befuddled by the question, uh, but we <laughs> would, would love to, uh, uh, Pat would love to, to chat with you more about uh, what you mean by yeah. that and yeah. uh, explore that. So. Is this open source? Um, when can we try out radical exchange voice for our own governance? That's an easy one. The, uh, it is open source. Um, we, I, I, I'm, I'm really hoping to expand it uh, in, a, in a later iteration after we roll it out in May um, so that it can easily be used by other communities for their own governance. Um, of course, you know, it's, since it's open, force, open source, people are free to fork it and play around with it themselves. Um, but uh, one thing that we thought would be really cool is if we could make it more of a platform where you can create like a group on RxC Voice of your own. Like we have the Radical Exchange group and then some other community can make their own group um, uh, with their own administrators who can run their own processes. Um, that's something that, you know, we would would be cool to do that we hope to do in the future but in in the meantime yeah feel free to check out the the repo fork it you know play around with it and especially if anybody feels like contributing that would be great because right now it's just me working <laughs> <laughs> thanks alex uh i'm just reading a couple because some of them are similar Okay, so this one, I don't know the answer to it, but it's a really good question by Gary again, Jerry again, sorry. Um, is the voice credit, is the give voice credit process transparent? Uh, will it be possible to see the original distributions plus how the credits get subsequently distributed? So it's transparent as far as you can see the delegates, like when their credits go up and down, who gave them the credits, I don't know. I haven't seen that be transparent in what we've done so far. Yeah, something we've thought about a lot is like, to what it is how to make it transparent and to what degree to publicize that information. Because one concern that we've had is that, is basically about bribery. Um, is that if, if we publish all of the transactions that took place in the delegation stage um, and I can verify that I received voice credits from you, then maybe I'm more likely to collude with you on how I spend them and, and such. So one thing that you know, we've, we've tended to think that we should keep keep it to some degree private or obscure it to some degree, you know, exactly who gave how many credits to who at what time. But what we do have right now is you can look at everyone's voice credits before 
um, at the beginning of the delegation stage and you can look at everyone's voice credits. It's that it's public information at any given point in time, how many voice credits each person has. So you can see what they had before and what they had after, and you can check to make sure it all adds up. And that's the way it looks right now. But we're, we're going to keep thinking about like what, whether it makes sense to include you know, more information about how transfers happen. Yeah, and I, th I think that the um, uh, this is this is something that we is kind of near the top of the list in terms of something to study and iterate on after the first uh, beta to figure out whether there's some. Uh, I mean, it might make sense to just make it all transparent ultimately, uh, or, or might make sense to sort of uh, um, give some kind of uh, partial information to uh, participants uh, about how credits were distributed around, um, you know, in a way that wouldn't make it easier to collude uh, or to strike some sort of, so yeah, we're not, we're not totally sure, but right now, uh, right now it's, it's, um, uh, it's not laid bare, but it might be in, in the future uh, version. Um, Pat Khan asks what critiques we've heard about our choice of polis, and if there are any, are there responses? I think we've kind of gone through what we are, our reasons for using it. And we've heard the most critiques so far, from my opinion, from my side on this call, but maybe you guys have heard more. Well, I think, you know, one, one thing that I've talked to a lot of people about is, is just, um, you know, there's a lot of, of advocates of, uh, uh, you know, in-person deliberation, um, which is totally understandable. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think that, that there are, um, there are things that can be done with, uh, in-person deliberative exercises that cannot be done, uh, that cannot be done with polis. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think that, um, you, we are uh, attracted to see what we can accomplish using Polis here. Um, but um, it'll also be interesting to, to try subbing Polis out and, you know, replacing that deliberative stage with, with like an in-person exercise. And uh, so these are all things we'll try. Yeah. Uh, and what are the biggest things we want to learn from this experiment? I could say, per, well, from Radical Exchange's perspective as the foundation, um, <clears throat> for those that maybe were at the Detroit conference or have listened to watch the whole thing, when Matt and I stepped into these roles, we, you know, there were things that needed to be pushed forward from the foundation that can only be done through a foundation. Um, but it was never meant to be like a hierarchical paradigm that we we're in. Um, so we, we've been working hard to, to make something like this happen so that we can open, we can actually make radical exchange democratic and deliberative in the way that we think it, we want it to be together. Um, so that's from my side, that's the biggest thing that I want to learn is how we can do that and keep improving on that and keep trying and experimenting and making that possible. Yeah, and I would I would say that I'm I'm just I'm really interested to see if uh, if stitching together these different phases, these different you know tools of democratic innovation, will enable um, wise, fair, legitimate decisions to be made by big messy groups of people. I mean, I I think that if we can get better at doing that. We can get better at making serious, good decisions that are respected in big groups of people online who don't know each other. There's a lot of ways we can make the world better. There's a lot of organizations that we can make more democratic um, if we get better at that. Um, so my my real hope is, I mean, what I really hope to learn is, you know, how to do that better so that we can make lots of organizations more democratic. 
Yeah, thanks. Okay, well, we're at the end. Alex, do you want to, do you have a, what you're hoping from this before we close? Uh, the only thing I would add, I think, is that I'm, uh, I'm especially excited about the deliberative and the delegative aspects of this project. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited to keep it, like, keep iterating and keep tweaking and, and keep experimenting because I'm, I'm really interested, especially in the implications here for uh, on on chain communities, um, with you know experimenting with how communities can can be fluid and democratically determined, while being sort of radically inclusive of new members and like represent people's contributions to the community uh, in influence you know like proportional influence over decisions um i'm i'm super excited about you know pushing that kind of that that uh conversation forward with this yeah okay well we're at the we're one minute past uh closing time thank you so much for joining everybody and thank you matt and alex for making this happen thank you for the wonderful questions please 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 uh participate if you're wanting to, able, go to voice at radicalexchange.org and just say, sign me up. Thank you. See you soon.